the final day of November on Today in Ohio, the news podcast discussion from Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer. Hard to believe that the final month of the year is hard upon us. I'm Chris Quinn. I'm here with Courtney Astolfi, Laura Johnston, and Lisa Garvin. And we got some news to talk about. Let's begin. Let's start by digging into Frank LaRose's efforts to make Ohio less democratic. Odd move by a secretary of state. His goal is to increase the percentage of voters needed to change the Ohio Constitution. Is this a trend with Republicans elsewhere in the country? And what do his opponents say they will do to defeat this idea? Laura? Okay, so yes, this is happening and voters are rejecting it. Republicans in Arkansas and South Dakota tried to increase the threshold in their states to 60 percent, but Arkansas voters rejected the report. Sorry, rejected the proposal on November 8th, just uh, this past election day. South Dakotans defeated it June 7th. So it might be a trend pushing it, but voters are pushing back. And obviously this would go up to 60%. The currently the simple majority is necessary. It's 50% plus one vote. So 140 groups have gotten together to vow to defeat the effort in Ohio. These are voters' rights and liberals group liberal groups. They include Common Cause Ohio, the League of Women Voters. Already, they sent a letter to LaRose and House Speaker Bob Cup and Senate President Matt Huffman, our favorite Republicans from Lima, asking them to halt the efforts. I don't really think that's going to be enough to do it. But if it does get on the ballot, the groups are going to form a campaign committee, work to defeat it at the ballot box, and even try to get some conservative groups on, on uh, with them. Yeah, I think actually this is going to be very easy to stop because it's anti-democratic and, and it, they'll portray it that way. It is anti-democratic. It's taking away some of the ability of the public to change the, the rules. What's, what's interesting is there's an argument to be made for making it more difficult to change the constitution than it is the Ohio revised code. Cause right now the rules are pretty similar, but that doesn't mean to make a higher bar for the Constitution, it could mean let's make a lower bar for voters to be able to change the law. And in that, it wouldn't be the percentage of voters. The, the requirement for signature collection mm-hmm. for this is pretty onerous. You've got to get a bunch of signatures in a whole bunch of counties across the state before the voters even get the ability to vote on it. And you can make that part easier while maintaining the current constitutional rules. I, I think LaRose, I mean, this is sinister because it's really about abortion. He, you know, the, the, it's clear we're going to have an abortion amendment, which would legalize abortion. And he doesn't want that to happen. So he's going to try and make it harder because the majority of Ohioans do favor a Roe v. Wade state with abortion. But would it pass the 60 percent threshold instead of the 50 and he claims that's not why he's doing it, but let's face it, right. let's he's, call it what it is. This is a sleazy move to stop voters from deciding the law. It's just as anti-democratic as you can get. And he's the secretary of state. And he's been in office for four years, right? He could have done this at any time, but he didn't. And now it's just like looking at the looming things about recreational marijuana or abortion. Uh, it, yeah. And the thing is... It could still pass. You know, things could still pass. Uh, Andrew Tobias looked at the past uh, about, I think, about 20 years and looked and we would have passed three of these. And that was same sex marriage that got 62 percent of the vote. That was a measure to ban it in 2004. 2011 health care freedom measure proposed in response to Obamacare. That was 66 percent. And Marcy's Law in 2017 to strengthen legal notification requirements for crime victims. That was 83%. But that minimum wage amendment from 2006 and the casino gambling, which got uh, that only got 53% in 2009, those would not have passed under those thresholds. But I think there were 16 overall that have been proposed and only five of them have passed since 2000. It's not like we are willy-nilly amending the Constitution. Well, and one of the reasons, look, we talk about casino gambling, but... The reason that went to a constitutional amendment is the legislature wouldn't do what the majority of Ohioans wanted. Every poll showed the majority of Ohioans favored some kind of change in our gambling law, and they refused to do it. So some wealthy organizers put together a plan that enriched them by giving them the rights to do it, and people wanted gambling, so they voted for a flawed amendment. If the legislature did its job, that wouldn't have happened. It's the same is true with abortion. 
if they weren't in an all-fired rush to outlaw abortion, even though the majority of Ohioans disagree with that, there wouldn't be an amendment going to the ballot. The amendment's going to the ballot because we have a government that does not govern according to the will of the people. And Frank LaRose is trying to enshrine that even more firmly. And it's, it is the antithesis of democracy. I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I do expect that they'll get this on the ballot because the legislature is lame, not just lame duck. It's lame. And but we've got a new, right, right. This will go then to a pitched battle. I think it's going to go down in flames. This is going to be an HB or uh, what was the the bill that Kasich passed to crush unions, and then oh, we yeah. came back. It was a right and, to work bill, right? Yeah, and 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 the voters destroyed it. Um, that's what's going to happen here. And this will hurt LaRose if he decides to run for Senate, because whoever runs against him is going to say, that's the guy that wanted to take your ability to govern yourselves away. He wanted to have the ruling authority. Let's not forget, too, he's trying to have two sets of rules. If right. the voters do it, if you do this by a citizen initiative, you need 60 percent. But if the legislature does it, you need 50 percent. What what possible justification can well, you have for two different standards? They do have a justification, right? They're like, well, it already needs a supermajority to pass in, in the legislature to even get it on the ballot. But hello, the supermajority is Republican supermajority. So I don't think it's that hard of a bar. The whole reason people go to do this in a citizen initiative is because the legislature is not doing its job. So the, the, you can't have two sets of rules. I think that is going to be a serious flaw in this. Uh, I think LaRose is full of his success in the election and he's in for a big fall and hopefully it'll stick. It's today in Ohio. What's the novel and an incredibly appropriate sentence given to two men who made despicable calls to largely black residents on Cleveland's east side to discourage them from voting? Courtney, this was a kind of a big story when it happened. You still marvel that it happened. And you got to salute the judge for coming up with this sentence. Yeah, this was really interesting to see unfold. Yeah, we're talking about here 24-year-old Jacob Wool and 56-year-old Jack Burtman. They're two right-wing conspiracy theorists, and they were behind, you know, more than 6,400 robocalls meant to intimidate black voters in East Cleveland and on the east side of Cleveland, you know, against mailing in ballots during the 2020 election. And common pleas judge John Satula was not having it. He sentenced the men to spend 500 hours registering voters in low-income areas around Washington, D.C., and, you know, we got a quote from Satula during the hearing. He said he, he just thought it was a despicable thing that the pair had done. And and he, he's a 71-year-old man. And he noted how civil rights advances have happened just in the course of his lifetime. And, and he compared these two's efforts to the violence that was used to suppress black votes in the South in the 60s. So Satula was was not going light there. And, and like you said, this is a pretty novel sentence. Now that these two had pleaded guilty to a fifth degree felony, they faced um, up to one year in prison. In addition to these 500 hours of registering voters in DC, they, they got to do kind of some of the normal stuff, two years of probation, $2,500 fines, ankle monitors, et cetera. We should send a reporter to it, this when they're doing it and write a story about how they're approaching people to see if they're doing it in earnest. I wonder if we can get access to that because it, 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 I think a lot of people would be interested in how these kind of, what they did was so monstrous and how they're recovering for it. We should do some uh, exploration of that, but salute to Satula for coming up with that sentence because it's the complete opposite of what they were trying to do with their crime. Yeah. And, and like you said, I'm kind of curious how they react when they get into this community service, right? Because they, they were very kind of um, short when they finally had their first chance to address the court. Um, Wool said, I just want to express my regret and shame. And the other guy said he was just echoing that comment from his, his co-defendant. So it's not like it was a big, long, I'm so, 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 so sorry kind of a thing. Yeah, and they also have to wear ankle bracelets and stay home at night for the first six months. So it's, it, there, there's some restrictions on these guys that I'm sure is making them buckle. It's today in Ohio. Yeah, and 
The latest partisan anic of Ohio's most controversial congressman, Jim Jordan, is to take aim at a fellow Ohioan serving in Washington. Lisa, who is it and what's this one about? Yeah, this looks like to be part one of the Jim Jordan revenge tour that he's been promising since the November election. He sent a letter Monday to the new alcohol, tobacco, and firearms director, Steve Dettelbach, who is the former U.S. attorney for the Northern District, Ohio, and a one-time candidate. He uh, wrote this letter. He's upset about these new gun policies. Jordan says it's a deliberate attempt to usurp congressional authority, and it infringes on Second Amendment rights. He says that the ATF has ignored his numerous document requests about the ATF rulemaking progress, he or process rather. He warned Dettelbach to preserve all records, and he said he may require testimony by ATF employees. So the couple of the policies he's upset about, there's one for ghost guns. These are guns that are made from kits you can usually buy online. There are no serial numbers, so they're not trackable. The rule calls for licensing kit makers and having serial numbers on all kits, running back background checks on buyers and, um, But Jordan says that's beyond ATF's authority to even do that. The other one he's upset about is that the new policies are trying to limit and change the classification of what are called stabilizing braces. These are, you know, like rods or whatever. They're used by disabled shooters so they can steady their weapon. But they, this new rule will classify these braces as short-barreled rifles, which come with extra regulation. So three million of these stabilizing braces have been sold since 2013. They estimate there are about 10 to 40 million of them in use today. they uh, Jordan says, but hey, they're not criminalized under the 1968 Gun Control Act, and they're not regulated by the National Firearms Act. So he's basically saying ATF has no standing here at all that it's Congress that should be deciding these rules. Yeah, I think we're going to see a, a circus with Jordan in charge of the committee. It's going to be firing in a lot of directions. I, it, it's interesting that he's going so hard at Dettelbach because Dettelbach just took over. So a lot of this predates his arrival, right? Dettelbach didn't put all this stuff into effect in the last, what, six weeks, did he? No, no. that's And they've been working on this, you know, these gun policies for a year. So it's interesting that he's, I guess he maybe figures he's the new guy. Maybe he can, you know, get in a few licks. I don't know. Yeah. And, and it's never with civility, right? It's always with the... the you know, exaggerated tone. It's kind of what's wrong with politics. And if if you have questions that are legitimate, you don't feel like they're being answered and you put out a statement saying, I'm, I'm going to get the answers now because I'm in charge of the committee, but it's over the top in the way it's described. It's today in Ohio. Is it actually looking like Lordstown Motors will produce a truck for sale after all these years of not doing so? Laura, what's the latest on this company that picked up and occupied part of the former Lordstown auto plant? Yeah, I am just as surprised as you. I thought they were going to go down in flames like I mean, literally, right? <laughs> because that wasn't that one of the problems that came right, up in their last... Right, on fire. Exactly. So I thought this business was done for. But three years after its inception, Lordstown announced Tuesday that the Endurance pickup truck has passed their safety test and received all the approvals they need to be sold. So the first trucks are supposed to be leaving the Foxconn EV Ohio plant for customer delivery this year. 30 of those trucks will be sent to key customers. Those are the folks who could make large purchases in the future, and that will happen by the end of the year. The rest will be in 2023. They're planning to ramp up production slowly as they resolve issues in the supply chain. So I'm sure everybody remembers the pictures, right, with um, with Portman and and uh, all of the the senior officials in Washington showing off this truck. It's this full-size pickup truck aimed at companies with large fleets. And apparently, uh, this key feature is it's in-hub motors, which let each wheel turn independently instead of using a ro- rotating drive shaft like most cars. So apparently, that's really cool. But yeah, there's been a lot of pomp and circumstance about this company. We didn't really think it was ever going to get off the ground. Yeah. And my question is, will the truck purchaser, even if it's for a fleet, rely on this very new company with doubts that it might be around for the long haul? Or do they just go get the Ford F-150? Maybe this is considerably cheaper and that's the inducement. But it's always a risk when you 
take a flyer in a new company because when you buy a fleet, you expect it to have around a long time. I guess you could have said the same thing for Tesla and te Tesla's doing fine, but there is a risk when companies do business with a new truck company like this. Yeah. I mean, it is good news for Northeast Ohio, right? I mean, this was like a big hope that we would be able to have something in that giant plant right on the turnpike and in, instead of just having an empty building. So, I mean, I do hope they make it. And they've had so many problems with their um, with the company. There was this investment firm that released a scathing report, report in March 2021 saying they misled investors to both demand and production capabilities. So you got to think that people are being pretty leery and waiting to see these 30 roll off the assembly line and how they're doing before they're really going to place a lot of orders. Okay. It's today in Ohio. Has Cleveland Mayor Justin Bibb chosen a new site for the police headquarters, abandoning the unpopular proposal by his predecessor, Frank Jackson, to put it way out on Opportunity Carter? Courtney, we suspected that this was coming, but the place he's going is interesting. Very much so. We got the news last night that the city is eyeing the 250,000 square foot art craft building on Superior Avenue. It's kind of nestled between East 25th Street and the on-ramp to I-90 West. And this building was built in 1920. The city described it as, as vacant. And there's several reasons here why the city thinks that this is a better plan than way out there, like you said, on Opportunity Corridor. First of all, it's closer to the city center. I think a lot of people are going to be happier about that. But, you know, the mayor is telling us that this is expected to cost about $40 million less than building the Opportunity Corridor building from scratch. This will be a, a rehab of this 1920 built structure. Another good benefit to this one is that, you know, the mayor says it'll get cops into their new headquarters building sooner, up to two years quicker. They're hoping that, that they get them in there by early 25 after the renovation work is done. And another benefit here is, you know, this building, it, it seems pretty clear that this building is going to be housing more police functions and operations than the Opportunity Corridor site would. So this is going to house operations that are currently at the Downtown Justice Center, where the current headquarters are, but it's also going to house things at a Payne Avenue facility that the, that the police currently populate. So the city is looking at that Opportunity Corridor site, and now this Payne Avenue site, they say this frees those two places up for development, and it houses everything under one roof. That Payne Avenue site is a historic building. It's beautiful. It used to be the headquarters long ago. We had reporters, police reporters, who worked out of that building. The coroner was there, and they actually played poker together there. I hope they don't do anything to harm that building and find somebody that could take advantage of it. The, the, the idea that they're going to save money even though they're being a little sketchy because they're negotiating the price. We know from when they were going to build it at our former building at 1801 Superior, how much money that was going to cost. And it was far cheaper than building out an opportunity card or it just makes sense to do what they're doing. Um, I thought they were looking at our former building again, but I know there's a, a suburban company that has wanted to make our former building its headquarters. And so I wouldn't be surprised if that's not part of these discussions. Uh, so what are we looking at? Two years before the police would be in there? Yeah, early 2025 is the goal. They're going to be hot and heavy on negotiations to get to that final purchase price. They have a sense of the range, but they've got to hash out the nitty gritty with the developer, right, before this moves. Um, and they hope to seek city council, city council approval, introduce it for consideration in January. So, I mean, they, they do want to move this as quickly as they can. Part of the cost savings calculus here is that the, the city has to pay increasing rent costs to the county because they sold their headquarters building to the county back in 2017. So the quicker you can get out of the downtown justice center, the more you save on rent payments, along with the savings that comes with renovating versus building a new and just Bib has talked about the need for speed here. So we'll see how quickly they can do it, right? Um, but that's the goal. Well, unlike with our building, this does not have adequate parking. So they're going to have to build a parking garage. I also wonder, anybody that's familiar with that, that is the entrance to I-90 West uh, right next to this building. And that gets pretty jammed up every afternoon at rush hour, even with hybrid working. 
how that's going to work. Uh, will, will that impede the ability of police to get where they need to go during rush hour because they're right on it? Um, we'll have to see how that plays out. I wonder if they make alterations to that entrance ramp as a result of the police headquarters being there. You know, we'll have to see one of the selling points was that it was quick to highway access, but those questions remain. Yeah, most of the day it's quick to highway access, but for part of the day it's quick to gigantic traffic jams where nobody moves. Now, they have sirens and big lights on their cars, so (laughs) maybe they can get around it. It's today in Ohio. It's not bail reform exactly because it still relies on cash bail, but what step is Cuyahoga County taking to help people get out of jail more quickly with bail? Lisa, another another move by this county government uh, to help people get out of jail. Yeah, the Cuyahoga County Clerk of Courts Office uh, debuted a new online system where you can post your bond 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can get on there and it's searchable by your name or your case number and you can find it and then find out how much your bond is. There is a 3% credit card fee that goes to the vendor, not the, not the county. And uh, there's also a state mandated reparation fee that would also be required through this. But yeah, you can use this for any kind of bond, personal, property, cash bond, 10% bonds. These were previously only payable in person or by phone. They usually handle about 155 of these per week. So this is a big deal. In a news release from County Executive Armin Budish, he says they want to make the process more accessible and further criminal justice reform. So yeah, that's really good news. It's good news, but we're still not where we need to be, where we're not using cash bail. I mean, we've been talking for so many years now. I think it's seven. We're in year seven of an idea that has worked elsewhere where you you don't use the ability to pay as a justification for holding people. And you basically look at how likely they are to return. Uh, The judges, the, the Cuyahoga County judges, stand firmly in the way of that, even though they claim they don't. And in the meantime, salute to the county government, to Budish, to the to the clerk of the courts for taking steps to help help people get out more quickly. If they can't get out, if they lose jobs, they can lose custody of kids. It's a big nightmare. This is a big move. And it follows by a couple of weeks, right? The county's decision to put some money into getting people out. They're Correct. helping fund the bail project, right? Correct. They're using $225,000 in ARPA dollars. That's pledged to the bail project, which helps poor residents that are charged with low-level crimes to get get cash bond. This was approved uh, at a December 6th meeting. That can't be right. Oh, they will be approving it at, at their December 6th meeting. Yeah, it's a, it's a good move. It's today in Ohio. So selling drugs, embezzlement, Ponzi schemes, the courts have given us plenty of commonplace but illegal ways of making money. But a Cleveland Heights man is accused of a new one. Laura, what did investigators say he did? Exported rifle barrels, more than a dozen overseas without a license, which you need. So Abdul Rahman Zala, he's 20, he's charged in federal court in Cleveland with smuggling goods from the U.S. And he's being temporarily detained until another hearing on Thursday. He's from Saudi Arabia. He's in the country on a student visa and made the dean's list during the spring semester at Walsh University in North Canton. And so he's accused of shipping 12 to 15 of these rifle barrels to someone he met online. That person asked him to ship them because they're illegal where they live. And the person and the country are not identified in the court records. But this happened within the last few months. What's a little scary is they found agents, found another five in his apartment and six more in the mailroom of his apartment building ready to be sent. Yeah, and we don't know what country they ultimately were going to, but it it sounds like wherever it is, People aren't allowed to have rifles, and by by getting these into the hands of whoever he was selling them to, that's that's what was crossing the line. It's weird because rifle barrels are basically, you know, steel tubes. I mean, they're they're very carefully machined and all that. But uh, it's a little bit surprising they were able to pick up on it. I thought it was interesting what he claimed they were when he put them yes. in the mail. Camera stands like um. <laughs> Tripods. Yeah, so that they, yeah, tripods. So they were labeled that way so that they would detect. And you make sense, right? They're long metal tubes. But I mean, what's 
actually got the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force an interest in this is the manufacturer of the gun barrels notified investigators that he bought four at a time because he said it's unusual for anyone to buy more than one unless they're a gunsmith. So it's kind of that if you see something, say something, but this is this is brought up by the seller of the barrels. Okay. It's today in Ohio. Okay, Lisa, this is part of your younger years, as well as part of your late father's. How significant is the closing of Record Revolution in the Coventry District of Cleveland Heights? How big was this place in its heydays? This announcement was really a shot to the heart for me and probably anybody who came of age in the 60s and 70s because we spent a lot of time on Coventry in those days. So a Facebook announcement last Friday said that they will be closing permanently December 31st after 55 years in business. But between now and then, they have reduced their hours. So they're going to be only open noon to seven, Monday through Saturday and noon to five on Sunday. So Record Revolution, or we used to call it Record Rev, for short. It was founded in 1967 by Peter Schlewin. Uh, and actually, the WMMS, as we all know, the big rock radio station, they based some of their playlist on sales at Record Revolution. It was acquired by Mike Allison in 1983 after Schlewin died in a car crash. And then he expanded to sell clothes, posters, paraphernalia, and Doc Martin's boots. But I'll tell you what, that's that's where we would go to buy our paraphernalia was at Record Rev. So I know it was there before 1983. And then Allison hired GM Rob Pryor, who was also known as Rob Love. And sales started declining in the 2000s as the digital era arose. And then it was downsized to one storefront in 2007. But yeah, I we, you could always find whatever album you were looking for, if it was a weird one, like the damnation of Adam blessing or some weird group that, you know, you could always find it at record revolution. And we would spend hours down there flipping through, they had big bins and you'd flip through the stacks of albums and albums cost about $6 back then. And my father who had a huge jazz record collection, probably about 2000 albums bought a lot of his records there. And funny story. I was there one time, you know, checking out and the guy looks at me and he says, are you Harry Garvin's daughter? And I said, yeah, how did you know? He says, oh, y'all look alike to us. (laughs) So, (laughs) but no, I mean, it was part of our cultural touchstone, record revolution, eat at Tommy's. You would, you know, buy your jewelry and stuff at Passport to Peru. I mean, so it was all part of that cultural zeitgeist of Coventry and it won't be the same without it. So when a new record was released that that you wanted, would you be there that day because that's where you'd buy it? I mean, the 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 as soon as it came out, that's where people would line up to get it. And Absolutely. was it all albums or were there forty fives back then? Uh, I, there were a few forty, but by the seventies, forty fives had pretty much fallen out of favor. So it was mostly it was mostly all albums, and then you know, later they had a few cassette tapes, but they really focused on the vinyl. Do you have any of the records you bought there still? No, and I don't. I gave up my Peaches crate. You could get a Peaches record crate from there and, uh, you know, to store your records in. But I sold my collection to a a friend of mine who collected vinyl about 20 years ago. But yeah, those are good times. Sad times. It's today in Ohio. Let's do some Cleveland pop culture. White Noise, the movie version of Dom DeLillo's 1985 novel, opens this week before moving to Netflix at the end of December. It was shot entirely in Northeast Ohio. Courtney, what are some of the locations we should look for in the movie? This was a big thing when Draft Day was shot in the Cleveland area. There's a lot of Cleveland in this movie. Yeah, this is really fun to see all the different locations that are going to be popping up. I can't wait to watch this one. It's from director Noah Noah Baumbach, and it stars Adam Driver and Greta Gerwig. And like you said, it's based on that novel, uh, you know, about a college professor, Adam Driver, who with his wife, Gerwig, and their kids, they've got to evacuate after there's a, a tanker truck accident, and that causes like an airborne toxic event. So that's kind of the setting here. It takes town, takes place in a, you know, a fictional college town and like also an urban center called Iron City. And in downtown Cleveland is, you know, the, the the framing for Iron City. You can spot the terminal tower in a few scenes we learned. And but then they went all around town too. They went to different college campuses. The the main character's house was was filmed in Oberlin. The little college town, they use the city, uh, the little village of Wellington as a stand-in for the main setting college town. 
Uh, they went to Akron, Kent State. Um, you know, they one one big scene here. They used an abandoned big box store out in Bedford to. Uh, they turned that into a supermarket for the film. A big scene. It sounds like takes place in that supermarket. Also interesting, they went inside the old Walmart at Severance Circle in Cleveland Heights and used other storefronts out there for some scenes. They ventured out to Peninsula for uh, like a, a summer camp where the family gets evacuated to in the film. And then there's a shot in Willoughby out at the Andrew Osborne Academy. Just a whole bunch of fun stuff around town. Kent, Kent, Kent State Student Center plays a bit of a role. It, it serves as a cafeteria in the film at the college. And then, you know, there's a shot at Bod Baldwin Wallace. So it's just, it's going to be really fun to go around and pick out the places around town that we can spot here. Yeah, I just don't know what to think. When you think about crisis, toxic, toxic event, you think, oh, let's go shoot in Cleveland. <laughs> I don't know if that's the best look. But we did have a fire on our river many, many years ago. It's today in Ohio. That closes us out for Wednesday. Thanks, Courtney. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you for listening. Thank you.